um, JCIT meeting, and I really appreciate you all being able to join us this morning. This is more of an update and kind of to keep us going uh, as we start our new year, uh, frankly, uh, with JCIT. Uh, there has been a lot of developments, as you know, over the uh, past you know, eight months. Um, OCA has been working hard with the courts to try and keep our um, legal system and our court system up and running and trying to make it more efficient during this time of COVID. So, um, uh, so I appreciate you taking time out of your day to, to, to get started with this. Um, what we're gonna start with is basically our program updates. Um, and if, uh, do we have someone here from Tyler that's gonna give us a little bit on the Research Texas Yes, I, I believe we've got Terry here uh, from Tyler. And Terry, I'm allowing you to share your screen. So if you'd like to share your PowerPoint, you're welcome to do that. Okay, great. Let me see if I can do it correctly. All right. Can you confirm that you can see my screen? Yep, we see yes. the status update slide. All right, great. Well, uh, thanks for letting me participate in today's uh, meeting. Um, it is definitely different uh, doing this remotely as opposed to being there in person, uh, but it's great to see everybody's faces, uh, even if it is remote. Um, hope everybody is doing well before I get started um, and, and that things are, are progressing well for each and every one of you. Um, just to, wanted to spend just a few moments going through the update of the different systems that we provide as part of the EFAL Texas offering. Uh, and then I'll open it up to any questions at the at the conclusion. Uh, feel free to stop me along the way uh, if you do have questions on a specific area. In terms of, of the program itself, uh, it, we, we've seen the coronavirus uh, pandemic really kind of change the way that a lot of courts have operated um, and the way that uh, the utilization of the system uh, has come into play in just the different areas. It, not only with e-filing, but also uh, with uh, the document access portal uh, and being able to access that with the social distancing that we've got uh, in place and, uh, and just being uh, more safer all around. Uh, it restricts the number of uh, uh, visits to the courthouse. And so uh, the online tools are as important as ever in this, uh, in this time that we're in. Uh, over the last three months, we've seen uh, a continued growth in, uh, in not only filings uh, and picking back up uh, where we were at the beginning of the year, but um, also in our user registration. So we're now over 400,000 registered users in the system, and we're averaging about 38,000 envelopes on a daily basis. So uh, the, the continued growth of, of users is not surprising. Uh, now that a lot of, uh, of those SRLs are also now beginning to file electronically as well. So, so that's a, a good sign of the program. I didn't mention the coronavirus impact, and, and I think it's important to, to just kind of shed light on what it's, what it's done here in the state of Texas and the impact specifically on electronic filing. We, we did see a, a reduction uh, in cases that were filed as soon as the pandemic broke out. That took place um, in the March time period, but really was reflected as we migrated into April. And we saw a 27% decrease or reduction in new case filings during that time period. I, I think the, the filing community became acclimated to uh, working remote and, and being able to uh, just continue their operations through the eFile Texas platform. And clerks also began uh, becoming acclimated to just adjusting uh, a bit to uh, the different norm that we're currently in. And we've seen a steady growth in those number of accepted filings and, and new cases that are filed uh, throughout the, the time period from April on. Uh, so in January, just to kind of give this a, a frame of reference, in January we were averaging 2,017 new cases per day uh, in the eFile Texas system. And in March, that number dropped down to 1436. Uh, in August, uh, it shows here that the monthly number of cases filed was lower than January, but by the daily average, we, we saw 2,062 new cases being filed a day. So we had gotten back to where we were in January 
during the August month. And then in September, we actually saw 6% growth from where we were in January uh, with 2,145 cases being filed on a daily basis. So it's great to see that the program has has rebounded and uh, the, the filings and new cases are continuing to be filed just as they were at the beginning of the year. Um, I know the the operations and the processes that are being used uh, to to conduct business and keep the courts operational and the justice system moving forward um, have changed a bit. Uh, Zoom calls are are now the new norm. Um, remote hearings. Uh, it, it's a it's a it's a it's a shift in the way that um, I think many of us uh, have 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 continued to do our our business. Um, but the online tools is, is, is a really good thing to have during these time periods, exactly why the state of Texas did go out and procure online electronic tools is just to be prepared for an event like this and make that transition a little easier. So glad to see that everything is, is rebounding and getting back to, to more of what the norm was uh, before the coronavirus pandemic hit. As we talk a little bit about our justice of the peace implementations, again, these, these are permissive. They are optional for those courts that do want to participate. So far, we've got 134 uh, precincts across 31 different counties that are alive. We've got 16 counties that are in an active engagement. I should say 16 different active engagements across 12 different counties. Uh, some of the more notable uh, of those 12 counties uh, in terms of population size are Dallas, uh, Bear, Webb, Parker, and McLennan. Um, we expect most of those to be concluded by the end of this year. Uh, and then we've got four additional engagements that are just pending uh, a kickoff event. So um, continuing to see some movement and some adoption with electronic filing as it pertains to, to JP courts, uh, despite not being a mandate, um, which is a good thing. That means that uh, the transition to, to utilizing those electronic tools that are available at the justice court level um, are, are actually being uh, leveraged, which is a good thing. In terms of our redaction solution, the tool has been utilized uh, about 280,000 times since we uh, began making it available. Uh, we're seeing about 15,000 utilizations uh, each and every month, and, and September was no different. You do see, if you look at the chart on the right, a trend that mimics the filing volume. Uh, and the reduction that we saw there with the coronavirus, that's to be expected. Um, and the consistency there, I think, is a, is a good indicator that the systems were performing uh, in a uniform fashion. And the reduction of filing volume uh, translates to just the reduction of utilization of our systems as a whole. We continue to have three different electronic filing service providers that, that have incorporated this tool. Although all the EFSPs do have the option to incorporate the tool into their platforms, um, uh, we, we've just seen the three um, embrace it uh, over time. The, the team that is working on the redaction utilization, uh, excuse me, the redaction tool is focused really hard right now on our telemetry aspect and really the automated um, artificial intelligence behind the scenes to make sure that it's identifying the right information and improving those um, those factors of identification of the sensitive information as we go along. Um, that's a continued process with those learning models. Uh, it's sometimes you you make adjustments to those learning models and they they step back a bit in terms of the success rate, um, and then you you make some adjustments and you move forward. So it's a uh, the data that we can feed into those data models allows for uh, better predictability and better identification and a higher accuracy rating as it pertains to uh, identifying those target candidates. Uh, we'll see uh, continued improvements of this tool here over the next uh, several months. In hey, terms Terry, of our, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. I'm, I, I hate to interrupt you, but if, can you oh, go back sure. to the redaction? But back to of the course. redaction. Shouldn't that number be going down instead of up? Given, the, that the, given that the parameters are already set as it relates to what sensitive data is, and, and in my mind, people should be recognizing that. And so, and as, and as they're recognizing it, then the, um, the number of times that we would need to do a redaction should be decreased. It should not have, um, um, and so that means that the number should go down instead of going up. Well, the number of people using the redaction tool, not necessarily the number of items redacted. 
So I That's want right. more people to use the redaction tool. So, this is so, bell and you know uh, belt and suspenders. And I don't mean to interrupt. So Terry, you can you know illuminate this for us. Sure, and that's exactly right. This is the number of times the redaction tool was utilized. It could have redacted uh, during the course of one of these utilizations, uh, one redaction element, or it could have redacted 20. This is just the number of times that redaction tool was used. Um, when the document contains sensitive data, that redaction tool is available. It's available anytime. But, but it, it goes through the process of identifying those redactions through the automated means when selected. So when that, that user says, I want to use the tool, they can click the button and it begins that process of identifying that. They can modify those, those redaction targets that are returned from the system if they deem it appropriate, um, or they can just keep what's delivered to them from that exercise. But this is, this is indicating that about 15,000 times per month, uh, the filer has chosen to click that button and initiate that redaction process. Okay. And and Terry, to back up, you know, <clears throat> I, I think we should promote this as much as possible, but part of that is the confidence in the ability of the AI to pick up the correct redactions. And you mentioned that you were looking into that. Is this, are you continuing to learn and is your system continuing to learn and how is that going? Yeah, and so it, it's a great question. Yes, it, the system is continuing to learn. It uses the data that is being delivered to it in order to identify those candidates. Now we've, we've worked internally uh, here at Tyler outside of the production environment with some courts to to give us more data, more documents that contain that sensitive data so that we could um, continue to educate the, the tool at a, higher, at a higher rate than just what is being used in the production environment. But the more times that it's used, the, the more times that the system is learning. And what it's doing is it's identifying those, um, those candidates and then it's using the response back from the manual edits as to whether or not it actually did its job correctly. So if, if it redacts something and a user comes in and says, oh, nope, you redacted the wrong thing, and they make those edits manually before they solidify that, the tool says, oh, I got it. I understand what I did. And then now let me incorporate that into my logic and, and see if I can be smarter the next time around. So you, 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 the more data you have to, to learn from, the more intelligent that model gets. But it's just a it's just a number of patterns in terms of it being able to see it and the frequency in which that transpires. So you indicated that the tool is, I guess, the user has the option to use the tool. Is there any upside in making use of the tool automatic? Yeah, we we can do that, and some of our customers have chosen to do that. So upon uploading the document automatically initiate that redaction activity and begin that process right out of the gate without a, uh, a, a definitive an uh, action by the filer to choose that. Um, that's certainly something that we can enable. I know when we discussed this in the past, and I'm trying to remember, I believe it was, it was filing such as occupational driver's license uh, that needs to be filed without the redacted version. Um, so I think there may be some some instances where the business process may dictate otherwise, but that is definitely a functionality feature that we can enable, which is the kicking off that, au that automated redaction process at the time that the, the document is uploaded to the system. Rebecca, do you, do you see any value in doing it automatically, Rebecca? I do, and I think we talked about that before, but I think there's a price tag, right, that goes along with this. Is that correct? I mean, in terms of if you ought to put that into your system, and I don't know if we, in our ongoing well, negotiations of a new contract, if we have discussed that. So Casey, I'll uh, put that in your court. Well, I, uh, quick question, Terry, is that, can that setting be done case type by case type, or is that global across the whole system? Currently, it's by location. We're in the process of modifying that to be case type by case type because that was one of the requests that we've got. But right now, it's by location. So, in other words, it's by court. So you right. would set that up by court. And so, Justice Simmons, the, that those features, um, I don't believe it would cost extra money to do it on the front end. Um, but I do re remember that our last discussions were 
over um, those kinds of doc filings that require to have that sensitive information in them by law, like a lot of the family documents, that there was concern that when you run it through the redaction tool, it's going to redact all that stuff that the court actually wants to see. And I believe right now, Terry, the way it's set up is when filers redact, um, whatever they burn in at the end of the redaction is what gets sent to the court. So right now the court doesn't receive both a redacted copy and an unredacted. It just gets whatever the filer submits, correct? Yeah, it's configurable. So each court can choose whether they want the redacted and the unredacted or just the redacted. Most courts have opted for just the redacted version. And I, and I, I'm only going out on a limb here and, and, and given my perspective, perspective, but I think it's just simply for the fact of the storage capacity on the back end of not storing duplicate documents. But there may be other factors as to why that decision has been made. But it is configurable. We can send both versions or just the redacted version. So I'm, and I, I think I'm getting what, um, what you're saying and based on what um, Justice Simmons said as it relates to the artificial intelligence. Um, so now we get actually get an increased number of users who's becoming familiar with applying the redaction tool. And as such, that's why the numbers continue. We see it to, we continue to see an increase, but that's a good thing because that gives the redaction tool the opportunity to learn the different variables of a of a of a uh, of the sensitive nature of a document. But I would rather we continue instead of applying the auto redaction tool as of yet. I think there's I would rather it continue to learn, and then maybe after a certain period of time. Then we um, then we look at applying the redaction tool because uh, if um, if all these documents are being uploaded into Research Texas, we'd rather that be a pristine um, database instead of one with um, with even just the smallest number of um, uh, of uh, documents with uh, sensitive data. I think that's right. I think in the you know the good side is people are learning to adapt. They're learning to understand it, and hopefully some of that. Mm -hmm. um, learning can be taking place. So I think in the future you do want to have, I think the clerks would feel better, everybody would feel better if we could have an auto redact and then the lawyers can deal with, with something, you know, like a draft, you know, something that they can look at and determine, do I agree or disagree? Yeah, the uh, the more the more intelligent the system gets or the better it gets in that artificial intelligence modeling, what that'll translate is, is not to fewer redactions taking place. It just means that it will require less manual interaction thereafter. Mm -hmm. So the auto redaction tool will be able to identify candidates better at a higher accuracy rate, meaning less interaction by the filer. Because today, if the mm -hmm. tool identifies, let's say, a nine-digit number and, and perceives that to be a social security number when, in fact, it really isn't, then the filer may have to go in and unredact that prior to submission. Um, and, and as the tool gets smarter, we're hoping that it can then differentiate between just a nine digit number and then a truly social security number. And that's where the contextual clues and the artificial intelligence comes in. But again, it's based upon how many times it sees those types of patterns and documents so that it, became, it becomes smart. And then of course the input that happens thereafter as to whether or not it did the right thing during that transmission. Okay. Um, one last thing, and then, then I'm, I'm going to get out of your hair. But I think this is more for um, um, Justice Simmons and Casey. Uh, I saw on the previous screen where we saw that the total number of filings has, in, we, we've, seen an in, we've seen an increase in the number of filings. But have each county, or have, has, uh, has there been any mention of each county looking at the, at, at, uh, the disposition rate? While we're getting new filings, but have we talked about those have been disposed of? I can tell you OCA is watching that um, very carefully. And, and I will tell you, we, we have that, of course, on a monthly basis, the information is provided to OCA. And um, it's interesting, I, I was, I'm gonna talk to Terry offline. Our, our data doesn't align exactly there. So I'm curious if some of those new filings are actually new, uh, you know, basically more people filing in JP court, for instance, or other places that because our filing data doesn't look exactly like that. Um, we don't have September data yet. It'll come in the next week or so. Uh, so it will still be interesting to see if it follows that that trend upward that this data shows here. Uh, and then we do have the disposition date uh, data, of course, um, just to give you the 
the bottom line is um, actually civil civil uh, disposition rate is over 100%. It's actually higher than FY19, which is pretty um, remarkable. Uh, criminal is uh, coming back, but it's it's been pretty low throughout the pandemic. Uh, that's probably the bottom line on that. Uh, David, does your um, does your data show uh, if it was? Well, I don't think in, in all of that is based on submission um, uh, by the, some documents being submitted for the court to make a determination. But none of that has been as a as a result of any type of. Um, well, I would like to know if it, if it was based on submission or if it was based on a virtual hearing, and, and I don't think there would be any trials, um, and any dis final dispositions based on a trial, jury trial or non-jury trial. Um, as you know, there have been very few jury trials uh, through, uh, mm -hmm. there were about 40, 45 jury trials from March through the end of September in the state. Uh, those were all ones that um, OCA oversaw uh, at the Supreme Court's order. Of course, uh, jury trials uh, were able to start back on October 1st. Um, not mm -hmm. all counties are doing that yet. There have been a lot of bench trials, so there's uh, mm -hmm. a lot of that. Um, and but we do not have data that would show whether or not the ruling was by submission or by hearing. I think okay. most courts are most courts uh, in the state are, are doing those by hearing. Um, not that there have been some courts that have changed to by submission, but I think most of them are doing still by hearing. We're doing re with remote hearings, but um, we don't have we wouldn't have that data um, because it's not it's not reported to us. Okay. So Terry, what I the one thing I've been hearing as and as as these cases get disposed of, um, there is now even more so because people are relying on Research Texas, real concern about the orders. Orders are in, some orders are not. Lawyers aren't learning about orders. They're thinking the court hasn't ruled. They're sending all kinds of please, please rule, rule, and the court has actually ruled months before, but the order never got out to anybody. Um, because right. of the breakdown in the in the actual processes in some of the uh, in some of the courts, right? So the they're they're not processing, and it's been probably exacerbated to some extent. Bear County is very active um, and has been through the pandemic um, in terms of kind of trying to move things forward, but there is a breakdown between when the court does their orders and how it that gets to a lawyer has just been kind of a mess um, and they're working on it and some of it works well. You know, I think it's time to really take another look at the process and get the court orders at some point. Um, and I don't like to mandate anyone, but if you're going to have a system that relies so heavily on digital submissions and that sort of thing, you have to have a digital resolution that's available and available in the e-file system so you can keep track of what's going on at the courthouse, particularly when, when some you know, counties and things don't have any other kind of access. This is it. Well, and, and if, I could, if I could also comment on that, I agree with Justice Simmons. I think I've noticed here in Travis County, more and more the judges are using the e-filing system to have the staff attorneys submit the orders once signed and, and entered. I, I think, if from the research Texas perspective, one of the most helpful things to attorneys is the orders. We, what we care about a lot of times is what have other judges done across the state uh, when presented with any type of, of resolution. So that's from a value proposition. I think for, for some of the attorney users, that's super valuable. If you're on the case, getting that information transmitted to you timely, like happens in Pacer, for instance, is super important as well. So I just wanted to chime in in support of that concept that the, the, the actual signed orders is, is, is super important to get into the system. However, we can possibly do that. So yeah, you, as, are, as another practicing attorney, I'll, I'll echo uh, Carlos's comment there. You know, that's, this is a no brainer. It has to happen. It's as simple as that. And, and I would just say to my fellow clerks out there, when we went through the ransomware attack recently, Research Texas saved us because our filings were in Research Texas. And even though we had no access to anything in our case management system, we were able to continue doing business because Research Texas had all of our active cases in it. And we were able to essentially use Research Texas as our case management system. 
you might think that you have the greatest system in the world and that you have no need to have your orders in research Texas, but you should think twice about that. When you get into an emergency situation, there is nothing better than having a redundant system that has all your documents in it. It saved our bacon. And just this, Simmons, I'll this just, is, um, uh, I'm sorry, Dave, this, this is John. I, I just wanted to just to add to what uh, Blake said. That's exactly why I, um, I volunteered to be one of the first ones. So because we, the more redundancy you have, the better off we are. But I do have one other question. As it relates to the virtual hearings, are those being monitored? I guess this is a question for David. Are those being monitored, the total number of virtual hearings that's being held um, across the state? So, uh, John, to answer that question, we have data uh, for all of the uh, users who are using. So, as you probably know, Zo uh, OCA provided Zoom licenses to every judge in the state. Um, not all the judges in the state have chosen to take advantage of that, and some counties have um, chosen to go on their own account. Um, I'll just, I'll just uh, uh, point out, for instance, Harris County has its own Zoom licensing, mm -hmm. so their judges are on their own account. But for all the judges that are on the OCA account, which is getting, it's pretty close to 2,000 judges, um, we, have data, we have data to show basically the number of remote hearings. I, I looked yesterday, the, the number just crossed over 600,000 remote hearings um, just in, in, since March. 1.8 million users um, using that. So we have we have insight into um, information on judges who are on our account, but we don't have for, yeah. like I know for instance, um, Harris, w uh, Williamson County is using a different product. Uh, there's a few counties out there that are using something else, yeah. but um, we do have it for the ones who are on ours. Okay, because in, in, um, in Dallas, we have some judges that are using those um, OCA Zoom accounts. And then we have some that are doing it through uh, Teams, which is Dallas, which is Dallas County's uh, uh, resource. That's then you have, and then you have some judges who are actually migrating to uh, use court call as a as a method of um, uh, conducting their hearings. And so, is there a way that we can actually kind of, I guess, I, I don't know, if we can require things. Just as Simmons mentioned, um, the the need to mandate people to do things, but if there's a way where we can capture if there's a resolution of a hearing or even if, even if it's a bench trial and uh, to say, yes, this was done via uh, a virtual hearing or through a virtual, a virtual process so that we actually get um, how global that is, how global or how we are using uh, this system to actually um, um, move cases through the system. Uh, the answer to that is we could. The Judicial Council has the authority to require that reporting. Um, mm. That would generally, responsibility would fall upon clerks in the district and county courts um, and justice uh, court clerks or judges in the justice yeah. courts. Um, but it, it has not been done yet, but it's something we could do. Uh, as you probably know, the Supreme Court's order right now says that um, the courts must use all reasonable efforts to conduct proceedings remotely. So we, mm -hmm. just, we should assume that most cases are being resolved remotely still. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, we could require that reporting. We have not done so yet. I, mean, I, just, I just see that as helping um, uh, uh, Tyler improve their product and how we're able to, um, uh, because we don't know what the next um, pandemic will be. It may be a, a, a physical loss of a, a facility to a county versus a um, versus a virus. So, but still the ability to have a, um, to be able to conduct uh, conduct um, hearings or trials virtually without the need of the four walls of a courtroom is, I thought, I thought, I think that should be one of our go our objectives. And to, to follow up on what John and David are saying, it, I don't know if there's a rule proposal or if that's something that would be helpful for our group to suggest or participate in any way, but certainly, uh, it seems that even when the pandemic is resolved, uh, whether there's future problems or pandemics of this nature or not, virtual hearings may be part of our more common routine process going forward. It certainly would be good to get that standardized in a way that practitioners across the state and judges across the state, clerks across the state, everybody knows what the rules of the road are on that. Um, so I mean, that if that's something that's for us to consider or for us to suggest possibly looking into that from some other group from the court, I'd suggest that. I, I would just, I, I just add to this that the um, Judicial Council, which is the policy making body for the branch, uh, just a few weeks ago uh, <clears throat> passed a resolution uh, calling for all, so as you probably know, once the disaster is over and the Supreme Court loses its emergency powers authority, 
um, a lot of this uh, remote hearings authority will go away. Um, there are statutes that are barriers. There are rules that are barriers. And so the judicial council, um, after hearing from a lot of judges who said, we, while we may not think that everything should stay remote, um, we see the value in remote in a lot of things. Um, there's what, a lot of positives come from, from this uh, with regard to remote hearings. So the district council passed a resolution calling for the elimination of the barriers um, in statute and in rule <clears throat> to continuing remote hearings. I know the Supreme Court is aware of that. I've had con contact with a couple members of the court who are looking at putting together um, a group to look at those and see kind of what needs to be done. Uh, exactly what you mentioned, Carlos, about trying to figure out a way to see how the rules should address continuing that going forward. And certainly there'll be some efforts in the legislative session to make sure any statutory barriers uh, are gone. Uh, well, okay. I have, go ahead. Go ahead. I have something else to say on the on the uh, <clears throat> the research Texas orders and judgment. Yes, there you I'll, go. <laughs> I'll, I'll wait and come back to that whenever we get to that again. Yeah, no, that's what I'm interested in because I'm interested in. I think I think definitely there needs to be the barriers removed for for you know offsite digital virtual hearings or that sort of thing, and that can be um, looked at. I can see lots of different points of entry in terms of Supreme Court advisory of rules, statutes, etc. But going back to the orders, because that's something I think that we can do something about because it's kind of a process and a standards in some way thing. Um, David, what's your insight into that? Yeah, I just re would remind everyone that there are two ways that can happen. Um, one that's maybe a little bit easier uh, for the clerks than the other. Um, and the, the one way it can happen is that the clerks can integrate their case management systems with the Research Texas system. And a number of clerks, um, not a tremendous number, but a number of clerks across the state have done that. And the, and the real benefit to that is that the basically Research Texas is pulling the information from the case management system on a one-time pull so that it's having the most current information at all times. So if there's an order that's entered today, it's gonna to be available in Research Texas whenever that query occurs. If the order gets sealed tomorrow, it's no longer available in Research Texas. So the clerks have 100% control over what's in Research Texas and it would be the full record. Um, so I know that um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done on that. Um, my understanding is, and, and Terry, if you could verify this, is that so far um, there've been a, a handful, I think maybe like 19 or 20 uh, counties integrate with eFile Tex uh, with Research Texas. Um, none of the uh, third-party case management systems um, outside of uh, the other the non-Tyler case management systems have have done that yet. So we've got some work to do there. So that's one way that could be done, and I think it's the preferable way to be honest with you, because that way the full records there and the clerks have complete control uh, over the the record, um, and it's it, it's we're basically going to them to say what's the what's the current status of the case versus looking in. What research Texas has. The, the other, other way is that um, there could be a requirement that orders and judgments be entered just as other documents are being entered into the into the e-file system, which then would put it in Research Texas. Um, that in a sense, Research Texas would have a copy of those orders and judgments as they're filed. Um, that is the second way. I would just point out it is it is certainly a possible way. Um, but it's going to require some, you know, require documents to be, orders and judgments to be e-filed. It would also require when there's a ceiling or other things that, that clerks take secondary steps. So uh, I don't think it's the preferable way, but it is a way that it could get there. And I would just uh, totally agree. I think the pandemic has emphasized the need for there to be a record that can be accessed remotely. Um, you know, it's people going into the courthouse looking at documents and court files um, has been very difficult during this time. And I think Research Texas has proven its value uh, and we should try to get uh, the full record there. Hey, David, so would you be, David, this is Laura. Would you be mandating judges to e-file then? Because from the clerk's perspective, if our judges, our judges hold on to those orders or you know, just don't e-file them, they're not gonna be in Research Texas. Or depending on when we get them, the timeliness of signature and uploading. Well, again, I would just go back to say that the preferable way is integration with, with Research Texas and the case management system, because then once the clerk enters that order or judgment into their case management system, 
it becomes available in Research Texas and it can be completely controlled by the clerk at the local level versus having to be uploaded into Research Texas. Um, as far as mandating, number one, I won't be doing any mandating. Uh, <laughs> if, the, uh, if it were to be mandated, that would be something that presumably the Supreme Court would do similar to its mandate previously for other documents to be e-filed and the court would need to consider um, whose responsibility it is to, to e-file those orders. Um, it could be in multiple places, I think, where that would, where that would occur. Or, well, or the Court of Criminal clear, Appeals. Just to be okay, clear. Or the Court of Criminal yeah. Appeals on the criminal side. And just to put it out there, um, we have had several challenges to the constitutionality of remote hearings, things like that. Um, but as far as mandating judges to put orders in, you know, the, the Court of Criminal Appeals has not been going that direction, but it's, it's, you got to consider the civil side and the criminal side. I think that's right. I, let me go back because, you know, I think that technology wise, there is a way to do this where it isn't like a mandate. My recollection and, and Casey and I and Terry have talked about this is that, that, that the clerk can, um, that this can be an easier sort of more automatic thing, even without the integration. The integration is certainly the easiest thing. It makes much more sense. And maybe I'm crazy, but there was, in my mind, even at those courts that aren't integrated, those counties that aren't integrated, there was a way to make it an almost automated process where the clerk more or less just says, okay, press a button, that it's not some large problem, but we would certainly have to look at what is the process and is there a way to automate it enough such that it's not a big pro process and it's more or less done instead of a mandate, just as one of the you know, kind of standards that we have. So, so I agree. I mandate your least popular, and and just not a real good way to go. But um, Casey, I know you and Terry thing, and I have talked about this. I would like to say about that is it, it's integration is not a one-time thing. Like David was saying, it it actually has many many calls, and it can affect the case management system. So I don't want everyone to just assume that once integration is set up, it's really easy and it's a one-time thing because it's not. Okay. So, uh, but to kind of echo what you were saying and what David was saying, uh, Justice Simmons, there are options. So you can, you can do things to where the judges can electronically file things back through the system. Um, you can set it up to where the, if, the, if the clerk wants to, they can e-file orders as well on behalf of the judge to get it into the system. Or as David said, you can hook up integration. And from a technology perspective, and, and Terry, jump in if, in if I'm wrong, but my recollection is, is that um, it's a call from the case management system to research to say, hey, this, this case has had a change to it. And then research calls back to that CMS and says, okay, tell me everything about this case so that it refreshes. Um, but like David said, um, that does give the clerk full control so that if they were to do that and go through that implementation process, then it's just part of their normal process. They, they take orders like they normally do. They, they put the event in the case management system like they normally do. And then it just tells research, hey, um, there's something new going on. And I certainly have, I understand Tracy's concern in a high volume court like Harris County, that's a lot of cases. And so there will be a lot of chatter that I would, I would assume that the counties would want to take that into consideration to see, you know, and I, I, again, I can understand Harris County probably has hundreds and hundreds of orders going out each day, every day versus your mid-sized smaller county where it may be, you know, a handful here and there or, you know, a batch in a week kind of things like that. So, so I do think there are options. Can I ask, can so I ask a question? All email or, or how do they send notices of the orders? How do you send the orders out to the, to the lawyers? I think there's different ways. Some clerks, I think, email them, but again, you have the ability in, in e-filing, you can, you can use the e-service function. That's what I'm saying. When you, you go, go in and say, orders, serve it to all the, all the, every, all the parties. Right. 
Yeah. Well, Justice, well, Justice Simmons, though, I mean, I think, I'm sorry, go ahead. lots of ways. I mean, that's. Yeah, I mean, we've set up a program to we, we email the, those notifications out. So okay. there's lots of ways that different counties can do different things. Right. But uh, not everyone is going and uploading them back to e-filing. Tracy, can I, can I ask, can I ask a question of Tracy? Sure. Um, do you think that Harris County, though, at some point would be willing to have orders in Research Texas, or is that just a non-starter? I mean, how do we, how do we get there? And how do you think Harris County would achieve that? It, it would have to be, we would have to go back and circle back to what I tried to do a couple of years ago which is having the, uh, the integration work differently than the way it's currently working. And we just didn't have that ability during this rollout to have a different integration between counties. But so do you think- The integration can probably with our amount of updates that we have in our system daily, it would only happen and work if it happened at night and not every single time something changed on a case. And see, I think that would be fine. I mean, that would put us, you know, much farther down the road than where we are. And, you know, frankly, as you guys know, I mean, you count for such a huge volume of filings in Texas, and there's a real desire, I think, to have Harris County orders in particular in Research Texas. And I, for one, would love to see that happen if it can happen. I think going to Laura's point, you know, um, I think Tracy's got a little bit different system there in a different way that orders get into their case management system. And I don't, I don't know that Laura's got that same tool um, and the ease of getting orders potentially into her case management system. So you're looking at, you know, different ways in which orders are uh, signed and delivered to the clerk. And so I, that's, that's part of the, the problem. I wonder though, if if there's any clerk out there that really objects to having orders in the system, and if it's just a question of, could we perhaps promulgate a standard or that says orders should be in Research Texas, um, and we don't really particularly care which method you choose, right. but um, to go to the, the point about mandates, but we need you to put orders in research. And we need you all to figure out how to do that. And whatever works best in your legal community with your tech, that's fine. But, you know, by maybe by X date, let's all try to get orders into research. Blake, but it's, it's so hard for the smaller counties who don't have a Tyler product. It's really, really difficult for those smaller counties. And I don't think we should lose sight of those smaller counties. They, they need a voice, too. Right, and I'm Justice to, Simmons. That's part of what I'm. Yeah. Maybe, what, maybe what we should do. Bob, just give me a second. Um, what I'm, you know, trying to point out is that we do have different technology in different courts and different resources, and that what we've done with e-filing, for example, is acknowledge that. So when we mandated e-filing, we did it on a schedule. Um, you know, we had the smallest counties go last, but we did say that we're gonna do this by a certain date and we need to figure out how to do it by this date. And what I'm suggesting is maybe we need to do the same thing with getting orders and with getting documents integrated into research. So maybe we need to talk about that approach. Yeah, Bob. And Blake, that's exactly where I was trying to go. What I would suggest we do is develop what is the preferred, what is the goal, and what is the preferred method to accomplish that goal, and then identify the various ways we have of accomplishing it for both large and small courts and figure out what it will take to do it in a reasonable time frame. And then if we want to go down the road, once that's done and identified and see who's impacted, then set up a schedule for, for implementation. And hopefully that wouldn't require a mandate that people would recognize uh, the value of having uh, an off-site copy of all the records. If not, then we can look at that at some point in the future as far as a mandate. 
So I, I, I think we're going to need to have an, a, a hardworking committee, like we've had many of hardworking committees, to really get started on this because clearly we need to anticipate and accommodate the many different ways, depending on the court and the setup and the processes that orders could come into the Research Texas system. We need to explore that. We need to figure out what the recommendations are. We need to determine how hard it is and what kind of costs the counties would bear, if any, to do this. And so um, I think it's gonna require a lot of hard work to go out into the, the community and start collecting some data on all of this. And I think OCA can help us. I think the clerks groups can help us with this. But I guess right now, what I'd like to know is who wants to chair this, who wants to be a part of this committee? Um, uh, so we can get this up and running because this is a really valuable thing we could provide to the court and to um, to do into our legal system. Hey, um, th this is John Warren. Um, actually, I, I have a couple of comments. I think um, this would be something that the um, that should be resolved at the clerk's level at at the local at the local jurisdictions because not all of our processes are the same. Yep. But but I, it is necessary. And again, I think it I, I, I strongly believe it's important that we have that that redundancy because um, of all the documents that we maintain, those uh, those court minutes, which are the final judgments, those are the ones that we have to make sure that we have forever um, as it relates to the, um, the subcommittee. Uh, I mean, th this committee on on creating this these standards. Would it be possible? And and um, while I'm I'm on a, on a lot of committees, I actually would like to have uh, some of my staff on the committee, and and my and not me, but some of my staff who actually work at that level, when it when it comes to the relationship between the, my office and the courts, is it possible to have those individuals on the committee instead of actually um, um, JCIT committee members? Yes. No. You can have you can have committee members that are not members of um, okay. JCIT. So if you want to pick out. Um, one or two people that you think would be helpful. They got to be workers and they've got to, you know, they got to report back to you and to the group and everything else. So um, but these, these are actually um, what I have in mind, the two individuals who's actually smarter than I am. So, Oh, I doubt that. But yeah, no, that's, that's good. I mean, right now I'm going to put you kind of your name in there until you can okay. provide me information about the the individual or the other, you know, two individuals that you think yes. would be appropriate for the committee. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Who else I wants can, to be I on can, this committee? I can help out on that committee as well. Because, That'd be great. Because if you, if, if, the smaller, if as much as I know about the integration, the smaller counties that have third party uh, mm -hmm. vendors, the vendors will have to make these changes in order to accommodate this integration, as well as those counties that does, doesn't really have a case management system. Um, you know, there's going to be impacts there. So I can keep in mind of all the counties in the uh, large or small. Mm -hmm. I, I, Laura? I, would, I, I would, if I can, I would like that we, we have to make sure, I, I've always been an advocate for my um, um, my colleagues in the very small counties who may not have those resources, but I would like, uh, and I'm not quite sure if Laura would uh, want to participate or if she can make a recommendation on, uh, on uh, if she can encourage some of our colleagues in the smaller counties who won't have those resources so that we can be a resource for them. Yes, Justice Simmons, we have some liaison members on the JCIT committee as well that are from some, from yeah. some of the smaller counties and I would love to be given just a few minutes to reach out to them. Maybe if we have a break, I can try and reach out to them and get you some names before the end of this meeting. Sure. Um, I will serve on this committee if you want me to, but I feel being in the top 10, we really need to get some voices from the smaller counties since you've already got John and Tracy's counties participating. But, I think we, we need to get some of those other voices as well, but I will, I am at your beck and call, whatever you would like for me to do. Right. Well, I think that um, you mentioned some concerns and whatever, so I would like you on the committee, but I also absolutely, we need some smaller committees and I know we have some liaison members that are on there and, um, you know, and I can make, I can touch base with Limestone County, a very small county that I have, um, some connections with um, to to provide us some information about um, their system and you know what it would take for 
little limestone county. I think they have 20,000 people in the county. So um, it's a pretty small uh, court over there. So, um, but I definitely think if we have, I know we have some liaison members. Casey, can you help us out with some smaller uh, connections yeah. to smaller jurisdictions? I know uh, Jennifer, and I'm gonna mess up her last name. Linden's with? Linden's Ah, there we go, close. Uh, is from Hunt County, which yeah. has been growing. I've got family out there, so it's growing, but it, it's still, maybe mid-size. Mm -hmm. But yeah, well, uh, I'll get Jessica, you. Jessica Griffith, Casey, would be another person that would be great. From the JP side, definitely. This is uh, Judge Ridgeway. I know it doesn't say that on the screen, but uh, <laughs> from Harris County, from the Justice Court perspective, you may recall the report I did back in December. Uh, we have a very, very few counties even doing e-filing. So do, doing things on a much larger scale uh, for small counties is going to be a re real problem, I would think. Uh, I think I reported we only had 23 counties uh, even doing e-filing. And of those uh, uh, five of the 16 largest counties aren't even doing e-filing. That was as of December. That may have changed a little bit, but not much. So when you try to uh, try to do these kinds of um, Texas, uh, the research council or any other method of uh, trying to make this information more public, I think you're gonna struggle a little bit with, with uh, the, the fact that small counties as well as uh, a lot of counties don't have the technology in place to be able to to comply with with too many orders well certainly if the jp courts aren't e-filing um then you know that is the priority for them is they need to be before we even get to orders we need to get them kind of working on e-filing, getting the technology in place for them and, and that sort of thing. So I think that at this time, um, it's certainly for those that are e-filing, important to get their input and thoughts on how it works at the JP level. But I think the focus for the order situation right now is probably on the county and district courts that should all have technology since they're all accepting e-filing and, and all of that. So they have some, and and and, access to research. So they have some, um, you know, basis that we can work with um, as opposed to a JP with no technology. And so um, that's what I'm thinking the focus should be is on the county and district court level with, um, with uh, maybe Jessica from the JP area and yourself, um, Judge Ridgeway from providing insight into the, some of the e-filing JPs. Right. Well, a lot, a lot of our cases, uh, percentage, it's small, but the volume is still large, Massive. are appealed to the county courts of law and 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 some of them on the state district courts and, and the like. So they, they end up in the system uh, uh, if they are appealed. Justice Simmons, this is Ralph Swearingen from Tarrant County. We uh, at JP Court there, we've been, we've been, uh, I call quote mandated, we've been mandated e-filing in this court since July 1st of 2019. And we gave heads up months ahead of time and have had a system in place that's worked very well. In fact, we're, we're at the process now of uh, using the e-file system for appeal. So we, we are, we've worked the appeal process out with our county courts of law. And now we're moving to uh, making it a complete step. There needs to be some changes that I can tell you in some of the statutory areas. For example, like in appeals where it's cash bond or statement of inability when, when uh, electronically credit cards and other things would certainly be feasible. But we've, we've been utilizing it for quite a while. We'd be glad to have provide input because we have written right. procedures for everything that we do step-by-step, step, not just for the process, but for our clerks. So they understand each phase of exactly how that works. And it worked really closely with Tyler Technologies to do a number of things because we, we have uh, Odyssey, uh, which any, anybody that has that, even if they don't have the Odyssey system, our processes, procedures could be used in any court, in the JP courts, the 800 plus. 
So we'd be glad to participate and help also. Excellent. I think we hijacked Terry's uh, presentation. <laughs> That's okay. We That's have all right. I just, I, just a couple of comments on, on this specific topic, just from maybe other places across the country and what we're seeing, the, the, and the feedback that we also get from eFile Texas. The, the, the conversation here is obviously very important. Um, this committee, uh, is, is um, it's apparent you appreciate the significance of of getting orders and judgments in the system from the legal professional community, the feedback button that we put into the research solution gives them an opportunity to, to, to provide that feedback. And I would, I would say it's about 90 to 90, 95% of the requests that we get are about finishing up the case record with judgments and orders and getting those into the system. So what you're speaking about here is very meaningful for that legal professional community, at least the feedback that they're providing with us. We, we talked about the, the manual effort on doing that if the integration isn't feasible, but the integration really kind of sets you up for a few things in which David, I think, did a great job on, on, on outlining. Um, a couple of other things that, that, that it does do, though, in addition to providing uh, less work for the clerks and then giving them the authority to manage those records and the control over those records is that you, you clerks would have the opportunity to uh, incorporate additional information like hearing information. And we're in the process of building in remote access to those remote hearings. So being able to go to a central portal to be able to have access to that information. And if you've got a remote hearing that you're participating in, being able to link to that with whatever the tool is, whether it be Zoom or something else. So, there's a lot of benefits and efficiencies that come with that. Um, as, as part of this, though, I, I, it, it may be helpful, and, and Justice Simmons, I'll, I'll look to your counsel on this, but it may be helpful to, to have someone like Matt Beigel, uh, who is the product director of, of, of our solutions, be involved at least on the onset of this uh, committee to just maybe tell the committee what's possible and, yeah. and give those options just to be able to level set with that group and provide maybe a foundation for them to build off of. Yeah, no, that would be that would be great. I mean, basically the first part of the charge will be just collecting information and we definitely need to hear from what's available, you know, from the from the Tyler's point of view or research text's point of view. And I do want to make sure that um, that that integration is possible for most of the popular CMS systems across the state. In other words, you don't have to have Odyssey to be integrated. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and in fact, in the state of, uh, of Illinois, they, uh, which is, they've got a lot of characteristics that are, are consistent with the state of Texas in that it's an EFSP model, it's a multiple CMS model, it's a decentralized judiciary. Uh, they they actually mandated the integrations with research. And so there's a number of different third-party systems that are building that integration and, and have built that integration. It's working, it's functioning. So it's absolutely feasible, Justice Simmons. Okay. And then is there a significant cost that goes along with integrating if you are a, uh, a different CMS? It, there, from a Tyler perspective, there is no cost. It'll be dependent upon that CMS provider as to what they would charge for that additional development. Um, I, I'd, I'd have to go back in and look because it's been some time, but, but previously we had five API calls for the e-filing integration, and I believe it adds two additional API calls in order to, to reach the research integration. So it's, it, you can kind of consider it about 40% of the effort in order to, uh, of what it would be for the e-filing in order to make it happen, but probably a little less because it leverages the existing APIs and that integration that was built. So you're really just kind of incrementally adding on to what already exists, assuming that the e-filing integration is present. Okay. All right. Okay. <clears throat> that sounds good. Um, Carlos, can I uh, count on you also to be, I, I would like a lawyer's perspective on this committee. Um, of course, I'll be happy to. Okay. All right, so we're gonna set that up and um, 
uh, get working on that because uh, I think it's really important um, that we get moving at least with some recommendations about what we can do about um, uh, you know, incorporating orders into the research system and creating that redundancy so that if natural disasters, pandemics, or anything else occurs, cyber security threats, whatever, we actually have another system. Um, okay, so um, we've taken a long time on that, so I apologize. Um, Terry, you may continue <laughs> if you have more to present in your presentation on uh, the uh, Research Texas and the guide and file system. Absolutely. Um, so I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll keep going. I think I've got just uh, two more slides. Just a quick update on eFile Texas. Uh, right now we are the self-help uh, portion of eFile Texas. We've got 45 self-guided interviews. Uh, some of the more notable ones you see over there on the left-hand side. Um, and I'll come back to that point in just a moment. Um, down in the bottom left, you see that um, the completion rate has gone up. There's been a lot of work that goes into uh, improving the completion rate. Uh, we've been doing some analysis to determine when people drop out of the process, meaning they start the process of, of going through the filing process to build those interviews, and when they may actually stop that process, and then identifying why, and then trying to, to fix that. A lot of that comes into ease of use and trying to simplify that process by providing the interviews in a, in a form of, of easy reading level so that the, the users can finish that uh, out, changing some of it to simple, simple language instead of being petitioner, putting filer uh, in some of the questions and things like that. Um, what you see is the, the utilization of the tool and the completed sessions on the bottom right kind of mimic what we showed on the filing volume, which is good. The interesting thing in September is even though it was the highest number of uh, completed sessions that we saw, um, we, we saw the decrease in the number of case types that are filed be heavily Im impacted by a few different case types. Uh, evictions is at the top of the list. Uh, debt collections, contract cases, and then OAG filings have all been really uh, impacted with regards to the, the filing volume. And ironically, evictions is one of those uh, heavily used uh, self-help interview forms. So we expect when those evictions come back around, they become allowed again, and, and we start to see those filing volumes. Maybe some of the um, uh, restrictions get lifted. Uh, we, would, we would see some of those be used higher, but the fact that I think that you, you see completed sessions at such a high uh, number, given uh, that evictions is included in that, I think that's a good, healthy sign for us in terms of where this, this program is headed. All right, then the, the last thing I'll just provide a quick update on is, is the research uh, Texas and the user adoption. We're continuing to grow uh, in our research users about 600 per week. We did see a, a pretty big jump in between the last uh, presentation that we delivered uh, and last month, just simply for the fact that um, the, the integration of courts with research is enriching that data and making it more powerful um, having a comprehensive file which is inclusive of judgments and orders is meaningful. So a lot of those users who are using the system are navigating uh, to the 19 uh, counties that have established that integration with research just because of the, the data that is present. And then I believe that the coronavirus pandemic, uh, of course, not being able to go into the courts to access those documents into the, to the clerk's office, being able to have an online tool to do that has, has driven the user community towards towards that tool as well. What we saw is um, uh, a 17% increase in user adoption since our, 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 uh, our uh, last couple of months. So we're seeing it, it grow pretty considerably here uh, during that coronavirus pandemic uh, time period. And with that that's, that, that's all we had in terms of the program update. We'd be happy to answer any questions that maybe that anyone may have. Um, thanks very much. Does anybody have any questions for Terry? Terry, would you mind circulating your slides? Or you yeah. can give them to Casey and Casey if you yeah. wouldn't mind circulating the slides. I'll be somewhere. happy to circulate those out. And I'll, I'll actually, we post them on the website after the meeting as well. So I'll okay. do that too. All right. That sounds good. Um, all right. So now let's talk about the eFile Texas 2.0 update. Yep. So I can give a very quick. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, I can give a quick but shallow update on it. 
Um, right now, we are still on schedule with uh, procuring eFile Texas 2.0. Um, and so we're, we're hopeful that, um, uh, that the process ends on schedule as we predict. So it's, it's moving along and, and um, hopefully we'll be wrapping up on schedule. Great, okay. Um, all right, and then now let's move on to our newest kind of subcommittee you know, that has been kind of activated and that is the JCIT Cybersecurity Subcommittee. And I'm trying to think who is on here that wants to talk about it. I'm, yeah, I don't know that I'm, I'm not, I'll nominate it. It's, it's either Judge Hind and- Okay, is Judge Hind on here? I'm sorry. We yeah, I'm here. People on here. Okay, there you are, good. Yeah, I'm one of the three dozen tiles. So we <laughs> had our first uh, subcommittee meeting last week via Zoom and it was really kind of a, uh, a preliminary organizational meeting uh, where we kind of drafted up what we thought uh, would be kind of the proper scope of our committee's charge based on uh, the way government is set up and kind of the, the hybrid where we've got the appellate courts and the Supreme Court and Court of Criminal Appeals are official state agencies that have to follow certain uh, statewide regulations. And then you've got the uh, trial court levels of the county courts, district courts, JP courts, and so forth that are uh, really more associated with counties. And so you kind of have this uh, dual track thing in terms of who has government authority and everything. And so we, we put together, I uh, believe, a um, proposed charge that we thought would be appropriate for JCIT to give us uh, based on what we understood was doable. And uh, that's basically our report. We, uh, Casey circulated a draft to the rest of the subcommittee of what he thought we would do. Uh, I got pulled into a bunch of other stuff and haven't focused on it too much. But Casey, did we get any, um, any commentary back from our subcommittee on this? We did, we got some feedback from Ed. So Ed, I'll let you talk. You, Ed wanted to add an additional uh, bullet point to the charge that I'm showing you all on the screen uh, that talked about, I believe, disaster recovery and the process around that. Is that correct, Ed? Yes, that's correct. Um, you know, through all of the events that we've had in Harris County, one of the things that becomes most important is disaster recovery and how quickly you can recover having a good plan for what are your priorities uh, and communicating that. <clears throat> and the same holds true for technology. When we talk about uh, in this tr draft charge, uh, data classifications, what's most important? Uh, what do you need to support operations, especially your most important operations and making sure that you have a plan for getting that back up and running as quickly as possible. Yeah, and you know, I think Dennis said it best during our subcommittee is organizations need to take the approach that it's not whether a disaster or a cyber attack is going to occur. It's more of what are we gonna do when it does occur uh, and taking that approach. Uh, I hope I didn't mangle your your aphorism there, Dennis, but uh, that was kind of the, um, the tenor I got from it. But anyway, we thought we proposed this to the JCIT to kind of get an official charge. That kind of gives us our, our, uh, our lane line so that we know where we are supposed to be working. And then um, we can start putting together different elements of these, prioritizing which ones should you know, be tackled first, which ones should follow on and, and start work on that process. And Justice Simmons uh, and Judge Hunt, if you don't mind if I add build on, um, one of the things that the committee did talk about and recognize is that one of the important things, and this actually talks to a point that um, Laura had mentioned earlier, that a lot of these things, or at least with, with number two, we're looking at best practices that we can we can let clerks and court administrators know, especially those that don't have very much IT shop out there. Um, so there are some 
cultural things that they all can be doing to at least help themselves or be aware um, that aren't necessarily um, hard and fast standards or hard and fast rules that you need to do this. So again, not looking to promulgate, you must do the following things, but at least um, here's what you need to be aware of. And here's some things that you can ask your IT shop if you have it. And if you don't have an IT shop, here's some things that you can do to protect yourself for when these kinds of things happen. So I would add, we, 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 know, we know most of the courts, it's a rare court that controls all of their county's IT directions. We're not, we're not asking to create a bunch of standards that you have to go convince people, you must do this. We're just trying to give tools to the courts, to the clerks who help advise them what they should do to help protect themselves. I think that's kind of where we're going. It would be nice if we could set some hard and fast rules, but we know in reality, we, we have, everybody has to work within their own organization. So just wanna help, particularly those counties that have managed service providers. If your county is small, you've hired out a company, maybe a local company to help you. There's some questions you can ask that can help you improve your posture with them and to help them improve their practice. I think that's really a worthy effort. And I mean, and I hope that we can just look at a, like you said, look at the smaller courts. I, I bet that from um, Texas Association of Counties and um, a lot of their kind of group organizations they probably also have been getting some information and we be, may be able to, you know, look at some of those resources as well and, you know, point those out because a lot of times you have this available, but you really don't know that it's, you know, that it's out there. So then uh, Ju Justice Simmons, are we okay with continuing on the cybersecurity with this charge? Do it, does anybody have any questions about this or, or does this seem like the right um, lane that we need to be in to, to move this forward? I think it's very worthy effort that we need to move forward with and I think it would be very helpful. So um, I am, uh, I think this is a good charge and I would encourage the subcommittee to, to really work to develop these recommendations for best practices. Excellent. Okay, any other questions? I don't think we need a vote on that. Um, all right, so going on to old business, I just wanted to remind everyone, and you should have gotten a copy of the recommendation to the Supreme Court that was made by JCI, um, JCIT through an email vote. Um, to recommend that we decline the request by um, news, Courthouse News to establish a, um, I guess a news queue, a filing queue that would permit access prior to the clerk's processing of the pleading. In other words, before the clerk saw the pleading, Courthouse News would have access to and then the ability to publish stories about pleadings that had not been reviewed by the clerks. And for a number of reasons, we looked at a lot of information. The clerks um, had a survey that they returned. And so um, we, we came up with a rec the recommendation to, to decline that. Um, just as a side note of, you know, <laughs> of the continuing saga, it looks like, um, and we don't wanna get into this, but it looks like Harris County is being, the injunction that's in place in Harris County regarding access to news organizations, um, that there's been a move to um, amend that as it relates to courthouse news. And so they are proceeding, I think, in Harris County and um, we will see how that turns out. Um, so, uh, new business, 
Um, and we have down OCA and uh, I hope David's with us. Um, I would really like him to give a kind of rundown because it's pretty impressive. What exactly have the courts been up to uh, in the last eight months during the pandemic and how have, you know, how have we responded to this um, kind of emergency? And David, if you would kind of give us a rundown. Sure, Justice Simmons. Uh, um, I think the bottom line is uh, we should be really proud of the court, the judges, the clerks, and the court staff, court reporters, uh, attorneys, and litigants. Um, Texas has been leading the way for the rest of the country and perhaps the rest of the world. I'll give you a little rundown of the history. Um, of course, the, the first case of, of COVID-19 um, was uh, identified in Texas on March the 5th. On March the 13th, the governor declared a, a state of disaster and a public health emergency in the state. Um, by that time, there were only a couple of dozen cases in the state, but it was, of course, growing fairly rapidly. Within four hours of the governor declaring a disaster, which gives the Supreme Court emergency powers, the Supreme Court, joined by the Court of Criminal Appeals, entered the first emergency order. In that order, it allowed the courts to uh, do a number of things, um, to suspend deadlines and procedures, um, other types of, of uh, sort of more uh, rule-based or, or technical legal issues. But it, it, sort of the, from, the, from this perspective, the, one of the major things it did was it allowed courts to uh, hold court hearings remotely. And that was a really key step um, because it allowed courts to do that without consent of any parties um, and so that courts could continue um, operations. Just to give you a counter example, not to pick on our good friends in New York, uh, but to give you a counter example of the path they took is their court system um, literally shut down. Um, they refused to accept filings from late February through June. So no filings into a court uh, at all um, because they primarily uh, do paper-based filing. And of course, at that time they were concerned about paper uh, and the potential of transmission. Uh, and they only held emergency hearings during that same period. I think they actually didn't start um, hearing non-emergency matters until July. So from the period of March through July, no hearings other than emergencies. And there was some discussion in Texas about should we limit hearings only to emergencies? Uh, and the Supreme Court and the Court of Criminal Appeals was very clear from the beginning that even though we might only characterize a few case tops or case hearings as emergency matters, uh, to the people who are trying to get their cases resolved in Texas court systems, to them, it is an emergency. And so the courts need to do their best to try to get those cases resolved. So again, March 13th was the day when the Supreme Court entered an order permitting uh, remote hearings. Uh, on March the 16th, so the next, that was on a Friday, the next Monday, uh, we began testing um, various platforms for remote hearings with about 20 judges in the state. Um, and by the end of the week, actually by midweek, uh, the judges had reported back clearly that they felt like Zoom was the platform that was most user-friendly internally and externally uh, and recommended that that be the platform that we use. OCA procured licenses for every judge in the state. Uh, and then, then on March the 24th, we, we trained judges and were issuing um, uh, licenses to all the judges free of charge. So March 24th is the day that we say we started, so in a, in a real calendar days, 11 days after the governor declared disaster and the Supreme Court authorized it, uh, courts in the state were holding uh, remote hearings. Um, I said uh, what might have taken 11 days would have taken 11 years um, pre-pandemic, it seems like, uh, but the courts were quick to embrace that um, and to start using it. Since March the 24th, we've had, as I mentioned earlier, over 600,000 hearings. We believe that's a conservative number. Um, I, as I mentioned to you earlier, we don't have Harris County's numbers. We don't have Williamson County's numbers. We don't have some of the Dallas County courts. Some of the others are using other platforms. So conservatively, 600,000 hearings held remotely. Uh, every type of hearing and every type of case has been held remotely. We actually had our first bench trial held remotely the, on March the 25th, the day after we trained judges. Uh, we had our first jury trial held remotely on May the 18th. Um, and we've had a couple of more jury trials held remotely since then. Um, 
So really everything is happening. We've seen some pretty interesting things happen as a result of it. One is many judges have reported increased efficiency. Um, you know, that might be one from our judges who are circuit riding judges who go to multiple counties. Uh, I, th I think about Judge Roy Ferguson, who says he travels two hours each way uh, to get to some of his counties. Uh, so that's four hours a day where he's on the road versus now he just goes to his bedroom or office or wherever and logs in uh, and starts his hearings. Uh, we've also seen judges indicate that they feel like they can be more efficient even with certain types of hearings. Uh, just because of the ability to move from one to the next. I'm not saying that it's perfect in every type of hearing, let me be clear, uh, or more efficient in every type of hearing, but there are certainly areas where uh, that we've seen efficiencies. In addition, from the, if you add to the, the judge's perspective, uh, the perspective of, of lawyers and litigants, uh, we did a survey in June of the lawyers of the state um, and uh, the overwhelming response, I can give you the detailed analysis, but the overwhelming response was very positive. Judges or lawyers reporting that they felt like the remote proceedings worked very well, allowed them to um, communicate their message to the judges um, and uh, that they didn't have any issues with their clients being able to uh, communicate and get their day in court. Um, we were concerned early on about um, the technology digital divide and whether or not some people would be unable to connect uh, because of this. We've seen very few examples of that being a real issue. Um, we've actually, you know, the platform that we use here allows people to use telephone to phone in. Um, and so people have been using that, although the majority of people are using um, video. So they're using their cell phone, their tablet, their laptop or, or desktop devices uh, to connect. Uh, many of our courts have set up alternative ways for people who might have issues connecting to connect. So using public buildings, whether that be the courthouse or library or somewhere else, for people to go and have a kiosk to connect to the court. So uh, that's been used. Uh, and then of course, um, if someone can't connect, being allowed to still have that uh, hearing in person um, in certain limited circumstances, um, that has been allowed uh, if, the, if the court can't do it remotely uh, since at least June. Um, we've seen uh, another pretty remarkable phenomenon where, um, and especially in our high volume courts, so you think about um, uh, traffic tickets, uh, evictions, um, child support enforcement hearings, those type of high volume dockets. Uh, we've seen something I don't think any of us really expected, and this is not just a Texas phenomenon, it's a countrywide phenomenon where we've seen less no-shows. So people are showing up in higher numbers than they would have before. Uh, I think it, you know, people were worried about the barrier of the digital divide, and I think what we've seen is there are other barriers that exist in the physical world uh, that may uh, keep people from coming to court, which are eliminated when we use uh, technology to allow them to participate. So uh, that's been interesting. Um, on the jury trials, we've seen something interesting. Uh, if you look at our statistics on the number of people showing up for jury duty in person, uh, we're seeing a drop, a decline in the number of people who would appear, not as much as you might think, probably around five to 10% lower than what would have normally showed up in person versus the, uh, about, I'll be at limited number of jury trials have done virtually, but in all of those, we've seen a 20 to 30 to 40% increase in the number of people appearing from what the normal appearance rate would be. Um, again, showing I think the convenience factor uh, has been there. Uh, we have been, uh, as the agenda points out to the Supreme Court in its order said that in order for a jury trial to be held remotely, we had to ensure that people who didn't have access to technology were not um, eliminated from the, the jury panel simply because they didn't have access to technology. So the way the courts have been handling that is they've been um, issuing supplemental questionnaires with their jury summons to ask people about their access to technology. Um, what, do they, what device do they have? Do they have unlimited data? All these type of questions. Uh, and when someone reports back some limitation in their technology, uh, OCA has uh, procured and has been providing um, iPads with cell service that are delivered to those individuals' homes and they participate uh, remotely using those devices. In our first uh, virtual criminal jury trial, which was held in August in Travis County, we had a panel of about uh, 30 people. I believe four of them did not have access to uh, appropriate technology. We delivered devices to them and it turned out that the foreperson of the jury 
ended up being on a, a loaned uh, OCA iPad. Uh, and his uh, response at the end is he would not have been able to participate in jury service um, had he not had that. Uh, we've also heard from a number of those jurors who said they would not have appeared in person um, because of the pandemic. And so they were able to participate in jury service uh, remotely. Again, I'm not saying that it's the perfect solution for every case, but it's certainly an option uh, that we think is, is viable. We've seen another interesting phenomenon with remote jury service uh, in that we, we have been looking at the um, uh, geographical diversity and demographic uh, representation uh, of those remote jury pools. Um, and they appear to be uh, at least as representative, uh, in most cases, more representative of the community uh, than the typical in-person uh, jury response. So we think they're, if we're looking long-term at, at some of the potential value um, that perhaps communities who've been underrepresented on juries before might be more willing to participate remotely. Attorneys in those trials have reported that they feel like the jurors are more forthcoming during voir dire remotely um, because they're more comfortable and um, seem to be more willing to answer questions than they are in person. Uh, but, but otherwise that's been a, a pretty uh, good solution. We've got a number of trials, remote jury trials scheduled throughout the fall um, in uh, all of our different courts, district, county, JP and municipal. Um, those are just getting started. I think there was a trial this week in Travis County remotely. Casey can verify. I know we've got devices out to Travis County. I've not heard how it's gone, uh, but they have been doing that. I know uh, Bear County, Dallas County, civil courts, um, a lot of those courts, JP municipal courts across the state are getting up to speed and will presumably be doing some of those trials uh, throughout the fall. Um, just to counter that, uh, you might know that um, in-person jury trials look very different these days. Um, they're limited right now to district and county courts uh, in the state, and um, they've got to follow certain uh, uh, health and safety protocols to do that. Um, we've got a video on our, on our court, Texas Courts YouTube page. You should go look at it to see what an in-person jury trial looks like. It looks very different. Uh, jurors sitting 70 and 80 feet away from the lawyer, uh, people wearing masks and shields. Uh, it, is, it is not your typical jury experience. Um, so I keep telling people that are uh, resistant to virtual jury trials that don't think that your jury trial in person is going to be very much normal either. So uh, I think there's uh, seems to be some some recognition that virtual might have a, a place to play uh, in some cases at least. Um, as far as um, interestingly enough, we allow we allowed people to start having in person court hearings again on June first, where they couldn't do it remotely. I was curious to see what would happen with the numbers of remote hearings post June 1st, and I'm happy to report that the number has actually increased month to month. Um, I think that's as more courts begin to use it, um, and it's, it appears as if courts are still using that as, a, as an option that's available. Certainly there's some desire by judges to uh, go back and have certain proceedings in person, in particular certain trial proceedings, uh, bench trials, other types of things. Uh, but as of right now, the Supreme Court's order still says all uh, courts must use all reasonable efforts to conduct proceedings remotely. Um, again, you know, the jury trials are up and operational. It is very difficult. Um, I will report to you, this is not specifically related to technology, but it's worth noting the reason why we think technology uh, has to play a role in this is that during the period from March to the end of September, I told you a minute ago, we've tried 45 jury trials during that period in the state. In a typical year, we would have tried 5,500 during that period of time. So that just gives you an, 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 a, a picture of what the backlog is. In a typical week, we try 186 jury trials in Texas. Um, and we estimate that um, on a good week uh, from now until um, more normal times, um, we, were, we are gonna be lucky to try 20 to 30% of that number which means we'll continue to build a backlog of cases. Um, and and it's, so that's, that's a big concern, I think, for all of us who are looking at this, which is the reason why I think, um, you know, the Supreme Court and our, our OCA's recommendation in the Supreme Court um, order basically provides multiple options. So in-person jury trials are an option, but virtual jury trials are an option. Um, again, not saying that um, it's the, the solution but we've got to really think creatively about ways to handle this so that we don't have such a tremendous backlog on the backside of this that we can't dig out. And I'm worried it's going to be years before we dig out of the number of jury trials. So the more we can um, get tried today are the fewer that we have backlogged in the future. And so 
all, all options are on the table trying to try to make sure that uh, we can do this in a, in a, a fair way uh, that ensures due process, but still gives people their day in court. So um, that's really the, uh, the basic update. I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. Uh, again, I would just say um, the, uh, the fast action of the Supreme Court and the Court of Criminal Appeals should be commended. Um, like I said, four hours, uh, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, and then the fast action by all of our judges, clerks, court staff, court reporters, um, attorneys and litigants across the state uh, has been remarkable. Every other state has followed us. Uh, we were first uh, in this, but every other state has followed us uh, and other countries around the world. And, and the judges of Texas um, have, have led the way and been the leaders uh, in that. So uh, we'll, we should be really proud of them. So David, can, on I, can, can I say something? Yes, go ahead. I just want to applaud uh, the OCA and the Supreme Court Clerk's Office and the Court of Criminal Appeals Clerk's Office because uh, he may have sounded like he was humble bragging, but they truly have done an amazing job with this. When you add in at the same time, they were dealing with a, a ransomware attack that shut down large parts of the judicial computer network. And they still, it, one of our judges up in Collin County is winning the William H. Rehnquist Award for Outstanding Judge in the nation. And I know her Judge Miskell, she's an amazing person, but I'm sure she'd be one of the first people to say that she couldn't have done it without the support of David. I mean, you know, she was out on the cutting edge, but OCA doing, providing whatever support they needed. And then I know there are several judges here in Harris County that are just chomping at the bit trying to get uh, to trial. And from what I can tell, OCA and the clerk's offices are just bending over backwards, doing whatever they can to help the courts that want to get back into court as quickly as possible to do it. And so, uh, you know, I, I, David, don't be humble. You guys have and Blake, and, and, and you've all done just an amazing job. And I, I, I applaud you. Thank you, Judge Hahn. I, I would echo that, um, David. Y'all have just been so impressive. It's, it's incredible. Um, I did have one question. I was curious if there has been any kind of survey about whether um, attorneys are choosing to, to do bench trials uh, right now over um, jury trials, or if it really is that backlog is just growing. Um, the re the reports for I don't, we've not done any any uh, formal um, data collection on that. So let me be clear. So all of all the information I'm going to give you is anecdotal. Um, the anecdotal evidence is that that is happening some, um, but I think the there is a pretty significant, and, and any of the judges who are on here can can say whether or not that's different. But there's pretty significant concern that. Um, a lot of those cases are just sitting there waiting for a jury. Um, that I know many of the judges have been reminding the attorneys and, and litigants that, you know, we can have a jury trial today I and mean, we can have a bench trial today or a jury trial in a year or two or three. Um, and just trying to, you know, but of course people have their right to a jury trial if they want. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think there's been a significant shift to more bench trials over jury trials. I think some, some cases have done that, but it's not been significant. This is Judge Ridgeway. I want to echo what uh, Dan said and uh, Karen said. It's been incredible. Uh, the, the dance between 27 emergency declaratory orders and having to change our dockets and reset cases. And despite all that, it's working. <clears throat> uh, this may be anecdotal, but uh, what we're doing is we're asking the uh, parties if they want to waive jury trial. And if they do, we're sending them through a process called e-mediation. And so we were effectively working with a group called the Dispute Resolution Center, University of Houston Law School, Texas Southern, uh, not Texas Southern, uh, South Texas College of Law and, and providing e-mediation. So none of the parties ever have to come to court and they, they try to resolve it without the need to even come to trial. So uh, I think that's the process is working well uh, but to echo a little bit the backlog that's building, uh, we have uh, 24 eviction cases, the oldest one filed on February 4th of this year, that are set for jury trial going into next year. Uh, we have 144 civil cases uh, that are also set for civil trials. And so 
These are pushing way into next year. We're, we're filling virtually all of our dockets all the way into August of next year. And norm, our normal process would be to have things coming to trial uh, within two to three months of when they're filed. And so the backlog is building, uh, but uh, we're also trying to manage it by uh, introducing this uh, e-mediation process and it's working pretty well. Again, David, thank you for all you've done. Appreciate it. Thank you, Judge. And, and I can tell you since we've started up uh, back with jury trials in Harris County, um, statistically, it looks like a majority of the cases, once you do say they're going back to jury trial, most of them we're seeing are settling. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're ordering the panels. They say they want these jurors. Uh, they are going to trial. And then the day before, oh, cancel that. We've settled. So statistically, we're seeing, you know, probably close to 60, 70 percent are settling without the jury trial. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I, I've told people all along, if you look at the statistics, 99.5 percent of cases in Texas settle without a jury. Um, they're either disposed of some way, they're dismissed or whatever. But those, in order to get that 99.5% to, to move, uh, we known for many years, you have to have the threat of a jury trial or some, some threat of there's finality coming. Uh, and part of the issue during the past six months has been, and will be in the future until we can get more normalcy, is the real threat of that day is really coming. Um, so it's, a, it's a, a case management mantra that's been around for years. I'm looking at Bob Wessels on the screen. He's been teaching this for years. Is, You've got to have that finality. And that's been part of the difficulty is some of these cases we know will go away once we can sort of say, this is, this is going to happen. Um, but that's, that's the difficulty right now. And uh, Laura, David, can, can you um, send us, so that we're not reinventing the wheel and everything you guys are saying is absolutely true. And in Dallas, we're trying to figure out how to do, how to kick off um, having jury trials. Lawyers are saying that they actually want to see the jurors was particularly during war and our process, but uh, so that we're not reinventing the wheel, can you kind of, well, can you send it to us exactly how you guys built that process so that we can use that as a template for uh, for Dallas County so that we can get back to um, jury trials because you're absolutely right. When they know that there is a trial that's gonna come and, and at the end of the day, it's a lot of effort just to get the announcement that the case is settled, but then that, that's the end objective is to get the case off the docket. So Laura, I, appreciate that. I know you wanted to say something. So I'm gonna let you talk now. <laughs> thank you, Justice Simmons. I wanted to also thank you, David and Blake. While the Hidalgo County has not had any jury trials, we did have two grand jury impoundments last, last week. We had a hybrid module going on both times and it was incredible. It was the response that we had via Zoom and then the people coming into the courthouse of course, our capacity is only 22 in our auditorium, but one day we had 18 people and one day we had 20 people in the courthouse proper. Um, but were it not for the template that y'all provided, we would not have been able to do what we did. So, so thank you. And, and we're ready to get going with jury trials too in Hidalgo County. So David, is there any move towards, I mean, when you look at the map of Texas, clearly you know, there are some rural counties that like have no incidences. I mean, there's one at least that I can tell has had no incidences of COVID. There's others where it's winding down and that sort of thing and hasn't been going up. Is there any thought to, to kind of modifying things geographically so that those counties where they don't have significant infections or a rise or whatever, can go ahead and proceed back to their in-person um, trials because their backlog might be bigger because as you mentioned, their jurors don't have the resources technology-wise or other, or even the IT, you know, even internet access to necessarily do anything. And, and so um, I know that OCA is willing to give them things, but it, um, you know, it might be difficult. So, what is the plan moving forward? Are you developing, you know, um, when you get to this certain point in the COVID outbreak, then you can start opening up this way. You know what I mean? Kind of. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. It's a good question. And so um, <clears throat> in the Supreme Court's order in May, 
um, basically there was a big shift from what was at that time kind of a state mandated, um, this is what you can do and when you can do it. And there was a shift to for in-person hearings that every county had to develop a plan in collaboration with their local public health authority. Uh, and that basically that, 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 that plan would be based upon local conditions. So in a sense, we shifted sort of the in-person uh, from, from in-person to from state to, to local control. Mm -hmm. In the order in September, with regard to jury trials, that same shift happened. So from, from March until the end of September, it was sort of a state-run process, trying to make sure we could get our hands around how can we do this safely? Because as you can imagine, uh, the Supreme Court has been, and I know Justice Boyd's here, but the Supreme Court has been concerned about two things. One, you know, how do we ensure due process? How do we let people have their day in court? But at the same time, we have hundreds and thousands of people who are mandated to show up to court. They don't get a choice. It's not like going to the grocery store or restaurant. They are mandated to show up. So how can we keep those people safe and healthy at the same time? So this, this balance has been difficult. And so in, in September, in its order, the court shifted based upon what we had learned throughout the summer, shifted to more of a local control again with regard to jury trials. So basically right now, as of October 1st, um, that decision about proceeding with jury trials, at least in the district and county courts, uh, is a local decision made in collaboration with a local public health authority. The, the, the judges have to check, the local administrative district judge has to check with the local public health authority about their precautions and plan. And then five days before trial, they say, they say, is it safe to proceed? In other words, are the conditions in the community such that we can call jurors together? That's what we did all summer with the state public health authority. And now the locals are doing that. So we've seen that shift. And that's the way that the court has so far tried to, to account for the differences in conditions. Um, I get every single day from the state public health authority uh, information about what's going on in each individual county. What I will tell you is it's actually a really, uh, I guess, maybe a concerning trend right now that appears that some of the rural counties are now actually the ones that are increasing. And so, again, to try to do this on a statewide basis is difficult because, you know, Travis County right now looks fairly good. It's headed the right direction versus some of the rural counties you know, maybe not so much. So it's just, it's kind of a county by county thing, which means, which is why the shift to that local control and local plans has been so helpful, I think, in the end. Um, so one of the other things I think with regard to some of the restrictions, so I've, I've had a question uh, from JPs and municipal court judges because the court's order doesn't allow JP and municipal court jury trials in, uh, in person right now. And part of the issue is it's just a capacity issue. So we've got um, 5,500 case, 5,500 jury trial backlog, 3,800 of those are jailable criminal cases. So those are people who are sitting in jails. Of course, statute gives them priority over uh, any, any other uh, cases. And so, it, and what we know is most counties um, don't have capacity to hear the number of trials before. Some counties don't even have a building big enough to bring together a jury pool. Literally, um, and, and, and John's shaking his head, and you wouldn't know this, but Dallas County is struggling with that right now. Where are they gonna bring together a panel large enough to, to, to pick a jury? It's not just the small ones, it's the big ones too. And so until we, until we can make sure that there, those cases that are the highest priority can move, that's the reason why we've had that focus on the, uh, the district and county level cases, primarily the jailable cases, CPS cases where there's a deadline that those have to be disposed of within a certain number of time before the court loses jurisdiction. So that's when the focus, giving the JPs and municipal court judges the authority to have virtual jury trials has been a way to try to let them have that. The other thing with regard to the restriction about um, in-person court hearings, um, the court's order still says courts should use all reasonable efforts to conduct proceedings remotely. The reason why that's still there primarily is as we start back uh, with jury trials, you know, the more people that are in the courthouse, the more complicated that becomes. Um, so it, the fewer people that can be in the courthouse, um, the more likely it is we're able to have more jury trials. And so the, the effort has been to try to keep hearings that can be done remotely, let's do them remotely. Jury trials that have to be done in person, we're going to figure out a way to make that happen. Um, but it, you know, just it's that balance of trying to figure out how to keep 
uh, the capacity down so that those jury trials can get started because we realize at the end of the day that's you know really critical way of getting the system back operational and moving uh, at the speed and the, and the and the process of getting people their day in court um, so those cases can be resolved. And David, I have, I have a, a, a suggestion or, or a comment and, and then a question. Uh, suggestion is, I think that I've seen you do presentation on these a couple of times. You guys have done an incredible job. I echo what everybody says, and I think most people agree. I think it'd be great if the lawyers and the rest and people across the state got more information about just exactly what you shared with us it, by way of either a bar journal publication or however, and if there's anything we can do to help get the word out, I think it's important for people to know that their system of justice is working uh, and how hard everybody has worked to make it work during these times. So that's kind of my first comment. Or uh, second question with regards to the, or question with regards to the length of time, my understanding last time I, I looked at this was that the longest jury trial that has taken place since the pandemic has been a day. And so my concern is for kinds of cases where we have multi-day or multi-week jury trials, it's extremely hard to do it under these conditions. I guess my question is, do you, do you have a sense of what the longest duration of, of jury trial days has been in any of the jury trials? Are you referring to in, uh, in person or virtual? In person. Uh, we've had uh, week plus long in person okay. jury trials occur. Um, I, I can't give you the exact, I mean, we, um, I can go back and look. Uh, we've got, um, again, 45 trials that occurred. Uh, several, I know at least one of them was a multi week trial. Um, okay, good. Uh, so it, it is happening. We, the longest virtual one we've had is one day. Okay. Um, and I, I'm personally concerned about multi-day virtual trials. If, if, and the, the main reason why is we can't do them the way we've always done them. Because, you know, let's, let's just stay on this, this Zoom call for six or eight hours a day and see how all of you feel by the end of that. Um, you know, so I think judges are going to have to think differently about the way that they schedule with virtual jury trials. You know, maybe shorter ones or doing half days instead of full days. Maybe a judge is comfortable doing two trials at once, one in the morning and one in the afternoon with two different jury panels. I mean, we've got to think creatively about the ways to do that because I do think doing six or eight hours a day for a week on Zoom is, it's gonna be very difficult for jurors to stay, for anybody to stay engaged. Um, and clearly we wanna make sure everybody's doing that. The Supreme Court's order requires OCA to put out best practice guidelines on virtual jury trials. We're working on getting that out. Um, I'm hope every day I keep saying it's coming out soon, but um, we're trying to get that out so that people will have that information. Uh, we put out um, guidance on doing in-person jury trials back in September. Uh, so uh, all that's out there, but. Carlos, your point about making sure the bar is aware of all these things. Um, I, I've given several presentations, as you as you know, but whatever way we can get out, if we need to do a more a more like a, a bar journal article or a video or whatever we can do, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And I appreciate you making the suggestion. We'll we'll look at seeing what we can do. Thank hey, you. Can, David, yeah. um, having mediated cases by a Zoom all day, you're right on target. And eight hours or even six hours on Zoom wears you out. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Uh, and so I, I, I think you're on to something there. And even if the judge did split it up so that jurors were only there half day and they were trying to two track with two trials, the judge is still going to get worn out because the judge will be on there for eight hours. So I think you're, you're on point to be thinking about just, you know, people's endurance uh, for that and the uh, their tolerance for having to sit in front of a computer screen for long periods of time. So that is so true. I mean, juries fell asleep. No offense. I mean, but when I was on the trial bench, you know, jurors would get their eyes glazed over all the time, and 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 I just can't imagine what they're doing during Zoom. I mean, I don't know how you ensure that they're actually really looking at the screen and paying attention and not secretly conducting all kinds of other things going on with their phones and everything else. So it's just, I agree, it's a new day, got to do something new. May I ask a question of David, please? Uh, we were talking about the response of the Supreme Court and the Court of Criminal Appeals to the situation, uh, the pandemic. Uh, have you heard anything about uh, the potential of the legislature weighing in some way on uh, IT and how the courts are supposed to proceed or anything like that? 
I've not heard anything other than the uh, judicial counsel's recommendation that the barriers uh, to proceeding be allowed to continue uh, or be, be removed so that these proceedings can continue. Uh, at least my conversations with uh, the executive and legislative branch folks have been um, extremely positive about the court's response um, and just doing whatever they can to, to make sure that the courts have the tools they need. Um, I think we've made the mess, made the, gotten the message across to them clearly that, um, you, you know, if the courts aren't able to function, that it's, it has serious consequences to the state. Uh, and so whether that's through budget cuts or other types of barriers, um, that there's significant impact to the state. So we'll need to keep making that message. Uh, Chief Justice Quinn, as you know, and many of you, many of the rest of you may know, uh, the state legislature has asked all the courts and agencies to cut 5% from their budget. Um, it, it will have an impact um, on our ability. And right now is a hard time to be cutting because we're trying to just keep ourselves above water. Um, so we'll have to keep making that message uh, clear about the impacts. But um, other than that, Chief Justice Quinn, I'm not aware of any other specific recommendations. Not to say there won't be some something come out that I'm not aware of, but I've not heard anything that there's any potential um, legislative actions. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much for that report. Um, very uplifting, a great way to kind of end our session here. Um, I'll open the floor then if anybody has any other new business. Okay, with that, thank you very much um, for attending. Um, our Zoom conference, and I hope we've kept it short enough so we could get some work done, but not overly long. And um, we will be setting up the um, subcommittees for the orders, and um, I wish the cybersecurity um, good luck as they proceed further with their charge. And um, we will be setting up probably um, another um, meeting uh, before the end of the year, but we will determine that, uh, whether it is going to be by Zoom or in person, and I have a feeling it'll probably be by Zoom. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure to see all of your faces. I really did like seeing you and know that you are well, and um, we will see you next time. Thanks, and uh, bye. Bye-bye. Guys.